I was a communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. Many of the incidents in the story you are about to hear are based on the actual records and authentic experiences of Matt Savetic, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. Here is our star, Dana Andrews, as Matt Savetic. There is no peace, there is no security, there is no hope for those who live in the chains of communism. Those misguided fools who, for one reason or another, have chosen to sleep in the red bed don't realize until too late that they can know no rest. They're worshippers in a strange religion, a religion in which their savior, the Communist Party, crucifies humanity to save itself. In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, Undercover Man. Dana Andrews as Matt Sabetic, Undercover Man. This story from the confidential file is marked Jump to the Whip. To most people living in a free country, being awakened at three o'clock in the morning by a pounding on the door is merely annoying. Unlike the citizens of Iron Curtain countries, you do not, as yet, live in constant fear of the MBD. But I was a member of the party, a communist for the FBI. And when I was awakened at 3 a.m. by a pounding on my door, I was afraid. Afraid that I'd been found out and that the time had come for me, like others before me, to disappear without a trace. Yeah, coming... I can't find the light. Wait a second. Oh. Comrade Morgan. Get out of the doorway and let me in. Oh, I'm sorry. You kept me out there until I'd awakened everybody else up in the house. Are you so anxious to be seen going out? I hadn't intended going out. I was asleep. Well, wake up and get dressed. Party business, Comrade Morgan? MVD. <laughs> MVD at three o'clock in the morning. I dressed slowly, stalling for time, while I racked my brain for some means of escape. But there was none. I went with Morgan quietly, hopelessly, to meet the man from the MVD. He was waiting for us in Cell Leader Morgan's home, and as the door closed behind us, his opening remarks did nothing toward soothing my jumping nerves. Is this our man, Comrade Morgan? Yes, Comrade Cormac. Good. Bring him in the other room where he can sit down. This may take some time. Sit down. As Comrade Morgan already knows, Comrade Spedick, I arrived in this country this morning to eliminate the traitorous actions of certain party members. The welfare of the party is my only interest, Comrade. That makes my mission less difficult. I'm taking you to Chicago within the hour. Chicago. A matter of discipline. It was decided to make an example of one man to discourage further crimes against the party. The man chosen is Woodruff Harper. Woodruff Harper, the Chicago millionaire? Mm. Through fear of the Un-American Activities Committee, he stopped his contributions to the party. Now, <laughs> he's begging us to save him. From what? Criminal charges of arson in connection with the burning of a large, heavily insured tenement building he owns. How was that arranged? 
<laughs> the two workers who set the fire have confessed to the police that they were hired by Harper to do the job. Well, that, that should make an example of Harper, all right. Precisely. But I, I can't see how it'll help the party's treasury. The party can reward as well as punish Comrade Spedick. That is why you and I are going to Chicago. To get the workers out of the jam? To get Harper out. When did you say we leave for Chicago, Comrade Cormack? Immediately. Well, then I'd better get back to my hotel and pack a bag. It's too close to train time. We'll be able to buy anything we need after we see Comrade Harper. And you're not to leave Comrade Cormack's side for an instant, Comrade Fettig. He has no personal knowledge of this country and is to be guarded against unfortunate incidents at all times. I'll drive you to the station. <laughs> Despite Morgan's orders against leaving Cormac's side for even an instant, it was vitally necessary for me to contact the FBI before leaving for Chicago. After Morgan had left us at the station, I tried to get away from Cormac, but it was impossible. Until our train departs, we have only seven minutes, Comrade Spetty. Seven minutes? Then uh, you better buy our tickets, Comrade Cormac, while I pick up some newspapers and magazines for us to read. The tickets were purchased earlier. Oh, you seem nervous, Comrade Spedick. Oh, I am. I just thought of something which might destroy my usefulness to the party. What do you mean? My landlady. I'm going to have to phone my landlady and tell her that I'm going out of town for a few days on business. Why? Why should you tell her anything? She might notify the police that I was missing. We might be picked up. Why should she even know that you are gone? Oh, because yesterday was rent day. I, I came in late, didn't see her, and... I didn't pay her. She'll be looking for her money, and for me. Why didn't you tell this to Comrade Morgan? Let him contact her. Well, I, I just didn't think of it. I was so impressed by the party's power in this Harper matter that uh, I, I had no thoughts concerning myself. Mm, I see. But if I don't call her... Uh, we can take no chances. You will call her, and I will stand outside your booth to make certain that there are no eavesdroppers. With only minutes till train time, I couldn't stop to argue, while Comrade Cormack stood outside my phone booth to make certain there were no eavesdroppers. I phoned my FBI contact. Beaker here. Oh, hello, Mrs. Carlson. This is Mr. Svetik. I get it. I, uh, I missed paying my rent today, and I, I didn't want you worrying. Uh, I'm forced to go out of town for a few days. Very important business. Where? Oh, I'm, I'm sure I'll enjoy the change. The city's so windy at this time of year. Windy city, eh? Okay. We'll contact you in Chicago. Oh, goodbye, Mrs. Carlson. Thanks a million. took you long enough to say nothing. Mrs. Carlton did most of the talking. Now we'll discuss that later. Now hurry before we miss our train. I wish you hadn't called your landlady, Comrade Svedek. I had to. Did you have to tell her that you were going on very important business? That was the best way to avoid suspicion. To avoid it? Americans can forgive anything done in the name of business then they should certainly forgive our visits for the Comrade Harper and Judge Valchek. How long will we be in Chicago? Not long. This afternoon, we will call on Comrade Harper and secure a large contribution for the party. Tonight, we will see Judge Valchek and secure his promise to exonerate Comrade Harper. What happens if the judge refuses to cooperate? He won't refuse. He can't refuse. That is why it was arranged for Comrade Harper's case to be tried before Judge Valchek, without a jury. Well, where do I fit in? As secretary of the Slav Congress, you will be able to arrange a meeting between Judge Valchek and me without arousing the slightest suspicion. Should I mention that you have recently arrived from Czechoslovakia? By all means, and uh, <laughs> that I bring greetings to Judge Valchek from his wife. His wife is still in Czechoslovakia? Yes. She returned to settle her mother's estate. It was her presence that gave us the weapon for implementing our plan. In fact, it was her presence there that instigated the entire scheme. 
someone had great foresight. Thank you, comrade. The hierarchy agrees with you. That is why I was permitted to make this trip. Congratulations. After I have successfully completed my mission of disciplining Comrade Harper and shattering the American workers' stupid faith in their judicial system, I will return to Czechoslovakia and join the hierarchy. What if you fail, Comrade Cormac? I will not fail, Comrade Svetik. I will die first, and others will die with me. Is, uh, is Judge Walchek a party member? He's a reactionary of the worst sort. Well, yet you think he will cooperate in exonerating Comrade Harper? <laughs> I know he will cooperate, Comrade. For a moment, hearing Cormac's statement and ghoulish chuckle, I almost forgot that I was an undercover man. I wanted to take his fat, greasy throat in my hands and choke the life out of him. And he seemed to sense my attitude. By the time our train reached Chicago, he was surly and uncommunicative and suspicious of every move I made. You walk ahead of me, Comrade Spetic. Slowly, so that we do not lose contact. You're the boss. I'm glad you understand that. Meaning what? It might be unpleasant if you were to forget. I never forget, Comrade. My mind was filled with deep, dark thoughts as I walked the length of the noisy train shed, followed by Comrade Cormack. In fact, I was so preoccupied, I almost missed the message when a man jostled against me and said, Take a cab to the Colfax Hotel in North Dearborn Street. The hotel manager will contact you when you're alone. The man and the message threw me off stride, and I must have hesitated for just a second because Cormack noticed the incident. What did that man say to you, Comrade Fettig? What man? The man who just bumped against you. Oh, I, I don't know, some sort of apology, I guess. Well, don't let it happen again. I can't keep people from apologizing for their clumsiness. You can avoid their clumsiness. Well, I was thinking of something else. And apparently you can think of only one thing at a time. Where do we get a cab? Downstairs. Lead the way. That's what I'm doing. Just follow me. We'll stop at the Colfax Hotel. We'll not. I'll direct the driver after we enter the cab. Reservations have been made by the MVD. to Dana Andrews, starring as Matt Sivetic in I Was a Communist for the FBI and the second act of our story. When we got into a cab outside Chicago's LaSalle Street Station and Cormac, the Czechoslovakian MVD man, ordered the driver to take us to the Montfort Hotel on West Roosevelt Road, I knew I had lost my contact with the FBI. At the hotel, we found that reservations had already been made for us, so Cormac and I went directly to our room. After a few hours' rest, we went to see backsliding comrade Woodruff Harper in his loop office. Oh, uh, go right in, Mr. Stavetic. Mr. Harper has been expecting you, gentlemen. Thank you. Help me, haven't you? I'll do anything you want, give you anything you want, within reason. Reason is an elastic word, Comrade. I will handle this, Comrade Svetik, though you're quite right. Thanks. Before we set a price on our help, Comrade Harper, let's first examine what help is needed. You are charged the with... The charges were framed against me, and you know it. The party exercises discipline in varying ways, Comrade Harper. Discipline. Watch yourself, Comrade. I, I'm sorry. You are charged with hiring two men to burn a heavily insured tenement building you own. You know I didn't. I... How large a contribution would you make to the party in exchange for complete exoneration? Any amount, of course. One hundred thousand dollars? Certainly. The moment I walk out of that courtroom, a free man, 
Would you give 50,000 now as evidence of good faith? It is you who must stand trial, Comrade Harper. Wait, I have no choice. You'll give me, us, the 50,000 now? To whom do I make the check pay? No check. This must be cash. Dollars. Check. It will take time to collect that much cash. How much time? Possibly be able to raise it this afternoon. I'll be back. If you have the money, you will be a free man tomorrow. If you are short one dollar, you will face the consequences. With Harper safely on the hook, Cormac's attitude toward me underwent a change for the better. However, when it came time for us to meet Comrade Harper and collect the fifty thousand dollars, Cormac insisted that I remain in the hotel room. You have earned this chance to rest, Comrade Speck. But you don't know the city, Comrade Cormac. You might get lost. <laughs> In a taxi? Well, you might get robbed. $50,000 is a lot of money. I will be guarded. Not if I stay in a hotel room. Even if you should drop dead. V, you and I have been under the protection of the MVD ever since we arrived in Chicago. Just when I was rid of Cormac and had a chance to contact the FBI, I learned that both Cormac and I were being shadowed by the MVD. Cormac had left me alone, and I was supposed to be with him every second. Perhaps that was to give him an alibi, away from the scene when whatever was to happen to me happened. My attention made me jump almost three feet from my chair at a knock on my door. Reluctantly, I crossed the room and opened it. I wonder if you'd mind turning down your radio. It's awfully loud. Radio? I, I don't have a radio turned on. You mind if I step in while we discuss it? What? What What color is your tie? Last night it was red. Come in. I couldn't get away to make a contact. How did you find me? Find a cab driver who drove you and your friend here from the station. What's the setup? Woodruff Harper stopped his contribution, so the party framed him on this arson charge. As a matter of discipline. Pretty stiff discipline. He's paying off, and he'll be freed tomorrow by Judge Joseph Walczyk, whose wife is in Czechoslovakia. Cormac has a recording she made. He's going to play it for Judge Walczyk tonight. Quite a coincidence, having Harper come up for trial before the only judge whose wife is in red hands sweating. No, that's no coincidence. A party member employed in the courthouse made certain that the case was placed on Walczyk's calendar. We'll take it off his calendar. Mm. It's condemning Walczyk's wife to death. Well, what do you suggest? I don't know. Maybe Walczyk will settle it for us. I'll turn in your report and get headquarters reaction. Contact will be made with you just as you leave Judge Walczyk's. Be watching for it. For an hour after the FBI agent left, I was alone in a hotel room. But much of my nervousness was gone now. Then Cormac returned, and I was freed from my vacuum. Cormac was unhappy because he said Harper had been able to raise only 40,000 cash. However, saddest that he was, he brightened considerably when it became time for us to see Judge Walczyk. And when the judge ushered us into his study, Cormac was exerting himself to be charming. You have a lovely home, Judge Walczyk. Thank you, Mr. Cormac. It misses my wife's touch. She is a charming woman. Did you see her often in Prague, Mr. Cormac? Just before I left, I saw her almost every day. Did she say when she was coming home, Mr. Cormac? Just as soon as possible. Did she send nothing more definite, no more personal word than that? Indeed, she did, Judge Valchek. That is why I brought this portable record player. She made a recording she wanted me to play for you, if I may. Please do, Mr. Cormac. Please do. The record is on the turntable. She was so happy to make this record. Listen carefully. This is Mary, Joseph. Your Mary, who loves you so much and wants so to be with you again. That's my Mary, all right. It's been so long since you held me in your arms, Joseph. So long since you kissed me goodnight. Too long, Mary, much too long. It has been thrilling talking to you, even on a phonograph record, Joseph. Please... Do anything you can to cooperate with the person who plays this record for you. 
Play it again, Mr. Cormac. Please, play it again. Presently, Judge Valchek. First, I would like your cooperation in a matter very important to me. Why, anything I can do, Mr. Cormac, I would be most happy. Dismiss the case against Woodruff Harper. Dismiss Mr. Cormac, you must be out of your mind. Before you come to any decision, Judge Valchek, let me play the other side of the record for you. It also features your right. Joseph, it's a month since I asked you to cooperate. Please don't refuse, Joseph. Please don't refuse, Joseph. I can't stand much more of this, Joseph. If you don't agree to cooperate, I'm afraid I'll never see you again. I ought to kill you. Kill you both. Or do anything you'll be sorry for, Judge Walter. What would you suggest, Mr. Svetik? That you do as your wife suggests. Cooperate. Cooperate? With communists, murderers, blackmailers? If you ever want to see your wife again, Judge Valchek, you will cooperate. I can't. You have no choice. I'll be in your courtroom tomorrow morning, listening for your verdict. As we walked out of Judge Walchek's house, Cormac laughed. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> oh, that sentimental fool, Valchek. Tomorrow he'll kill the judges against Comrade Harper just to save his wife. Is that so funny, Comrade Cormac? <laughs> it is to me. I watched his wife die just after I had persuaded her to make those recordings. <laughs> this has been a very rewarding mission. A very rewarding mission. The phrase didn't make sense until I suddenly remembered Cormac's yarn about Harper's giving him only 40000 instead of 50000 $10,000 would make this a very rewarding mission. Momentarily, though, I lost interest in that subject when I saw two men waiting for Cormac and me in our cab. Only the FBI and the communist MVD knew that we had gone to Judge Walchek, and I knew these men were not from the FBI. I decided to do what I could to square things for Judge Walchek's wife. I took a wild guess and silently prayed it would come off. As the cab door opened and the MDD men stepped out toward us, I said, I denounce Comrade Cormac for misappropriations of party funds, comrades. Thank you, Comrade Svetik. We know all about it. What are you talking about? You turned over only 40000 of the $50,000 Comrade Harper gave you. He gave me only 40000 He says he gave you 50000 He lies. Comrade Cormac lies. I'm making charges against him in my report. In fact, just now, he was gloating over the rewards of this mission. He's lying, comrades, lying. We believe him, Cormac, because we know that Comrade Harper gave you $50,000. You know? Harper's office is wired. We listened while he counted it out to you. Get in, Cormac. It will be easier if you come quietly. And me, comrades? You had better find another cab, Comrade Svetik. Thanks. Thank your loyalty to the party, comrade. Had you not denounced Cormac, you would be taking this ride, too. Immediately after the cab pulled away, my FBI contact appeared. My knees were still shaking as I gave him a full report, including Cormac's account of the death of Judge Walchek's wife. He took it from there and told me about it the next day, just as I was ready to leave for home. It was a good job, man. You boys moved fast. Fast enough to save Harper's 50 grand from going to work for the commies, but not fast enough to save Cormac. What happens to Harper? The case is being continued until we have a confession of perjury from the two goons who set the fire. A confession which will exonerate Harper and convict the party. Can you get that kind of confession? <laughs> they were talking when I left them at headquarters, hoping to cop a plea. I was watching Judge Walchek's face when I told him what happened to his wife. I have no doubt they'll pay the full penalty for their crime. As I walked toward my train, my mind was preoccupied with thoughts of the complete ruthlessness and the utter disregard of all human values, which were the qualities that attracted official attention to Comrade Cormac. Exerted in the interests of the party, those qualities can lead to a place in the hierarchy. Exerted for personal profit, they can lead only to the unpleasant attentions of the MVD. 
up toward the hierarchy or down to the NVD. That's the path the great mass of communists must tread or walk alone. As a communist for the FBI, I chose to walk alone. Turn in just a moment. This is Dana Andrews. In this struggle between free men and puppets, the masters of the puppets bar no hold. It is, at the moment, a silent struggle. But don't let the silence fool you. It's a struggle to the death. To protect innocent persons, the names, dates, and places used in this story were fictitious. Next week, we'll bring you another strange adventure based on the fantastic experiences of Matt Savetic. Join us, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> 